Commercial fishing is one of America's first industries, dating back over 400 years. Seafood is an important part of life in Louisiana. Nearly one-third of all the seafood consumed in the United States is provided by Louisiana. The traditions of catching, cooking, and eating seafood are ingrained in Louisiana life. When you choose a career in Louisiana seafood, you're supporting the traditions, lifestyles, and environment that have sustained the people of Louisiana and fed the nation for centuries. Hello everyone, I'm Shauna Sanford. Welcome to Catch a Career, opportunities in the Louisiana seafood industry. I have a question for you. How many of you out there like to order seafood when you go out to eat? Fried shrimp, fish, oysters, crawfish? Are you hungry yet? Well, chances are pretty good that just about every time you order seafood from any menu, just about anywhere in the country, it probably came from Louisiana. Now, have you ever thought about what it takes to get that seafood from the water to your plate? Well, it's a big process and someone has to do it. One day, that someone could be you. Today, we're going to take you on an exciting trip to learn more about how you could earn a living in the huge and important money-making seafood industry. In a moment, I'll be joined by experts in the field who will share some important information and take questions from students all around the state. And just so you know, there are 200 schools and 8,000 students tuning in right now, and that is pretty terrific. Here's how it's going to work. There will be two sessions. First, we'll look at what goes into farming and catching seafood, also known as harvesting. Then we'll take a look at what goes into getting the seafood ready to sell. That's called processing. During the second session, we'll explore how to sell what you've caught to wholesalers. That's the distribution part of the seafood business. And then we'll take a closer look at the marketing side, which is making the seafood so appealing that potential customers just like yourselves will go out there and buy it. Right now, though, I'd like to introduce you to someone who knows quite a lot about the business of seafood. Here's Ewell Smith, director of the Louisiana Seafood Promotions and Marketing Board. It, it's an important business to our state. Uh, about 30,000 jobs are directly impacted by the business. It's over a $2 billion business to our state when you look at the economic impact and the multiplier effect of uh, you know, the seafood industry is huge. Uh, you think about the guy who goes out and catches the, 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 the fish or the crabs or the oysters. Well, there's also somebody who helped with the bait. There's somebody who helped with the crab traps or the nets or the gear or, or the rigging for the boats. Then there's the fisherman and his deckhand. Then there's the guy he's buying gas from at the dock. And then when he catches the product, he's bringing the product in, landing it at a dock. He's bringing that product from the dock to a processor. From, from the, and the processor employs hundreds of people. And then, and, and then from the process, it goes back on a truck and then it goes out to the distribution channels. It might go straight to a distributor or it might go straight to a restaurant or it might go straight to a retail chain. And every one of those steps has hundreds of, uh, hundreds of people that are, that are employed by the industry as well. So the multiplier effect and all the fingers that goes across the state and the nation, because our product goes not just across Louisiana, but you know, we have big, huge markets in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and up and down the Eastern Seaboard. Big business for Louisiana. Recognizing the resource, that golden egg, and figuring out how you can tap into it, it gives you those opportunities. Whether you want to run a restaurant, have your own restaurant, be part of the distribution channels, you're not, you're not bound by the coast. You can take this product and go anywhere in the U.S. and make a living doing it. If I had been a child and somebody had, I had the opportunity to see a video like this, I would encourage people to go find, ask your friend, friend, friends and family, do you have somebody in the business? And go talk to them. Or go spend some time, go down to some of the docks in Louisiana and talk to the fishermen. The one thing about our fishermen that I love is, the same thing with our chefs, is a passion for what they do. They do it because they love doing it. You don't find that in a lot of businesses. And that's what's unique and special about our fishing community. And they're some of the most resilient people you'll ever meet. You know, they've stayed, think about it, they've stayed in the business and we've been through a lot of crises the past few years, big crises. And they're still in the business because they love it. There are not too many people I meet in other businesses that have that kind of passion. Our chefs have that same kind of passion as well. The two come together and they work great. 
Well, as you just saw, Louisiana is blessed to have such a wonderful abundance of seafood as a natural resource. And as a result, there are many different jobs available from north to central to south Louisiana. Harvesting is an important part of this industry. That's farming and catching the seafood. So what would your typical day look like if you decided to go that route? Well, you're about to find out from reporter John Jackson and the Luke family as they catch crabs and the Slavic brothers as they harvest oysters. Luke's Seafood is located just off Shrimpers Row in Dulac, Louisiana. You can't miss the big yellow warehouse right in the front. When it comes to seafood, if it's in season, they usually have it. A quick knock on the door and Miss Trudy will get you what you need. Trudy runs the biz end of Luke's Seafood, but don't think she won't jump in a boat and carry her own in the water. Okay. But today it's husband Tim and son Andy. They will help us understand more about catching blue crab as it's been done for many generations in their family. I've been a commercial fisherman since I'm nine years old. I ran my first shrimp boat at the age of 13. But you know, my daddy always did tell me, you got to make fun of what you do for a living. Otherwise, it's not a living. It's not a living. You know, you gotta love what you're doing. Today we are out to gather blue crab with the Lukes of Luke Seafood. Out of the gate early, but early is every day when you are crabbing for a paycheck. What kind of numbers are you looking in each trap? What's a good trap? Always you're looking for the most. But I mean a decent trap, a dozen, 15 crab. Trap to the trap. Tons of what I call street knowledge goes into crabbing. Knowing the area, tides, trenches, trenosis, placement of traps where the crabs are moving. Yes, crabs do move, a lot. Now, is there a way that you're placing it in the currents or it doesn't matter as long as it's on the bottom? No, different areas, different places, different crabs, different ways. It goes on and on. And did I mention the expense of just getting one trap in the water? It is an expensive hard business. This year, I, pro I probably invested $30,000 into my business. I had a 24-foot Carolina. Busted a hole in it, I had to go buy a new one. Right at $17,000. An engine, $18,000. And when you're looking at traps at $35 a piece, you're looking at serious money. And you can't fish with no, nothing less than 300 traps. That's a, that's a legal crab or an illegal? That's a legal crab. This is a legal crab, so yeah, that's that five Yeah, that crab right there is about five and a half inches. And what he's saying is, is they're measuring, when they say tip to tip, these two points right here has to be five inches across to be legal. That's a what? Or maybe even a packed pat crab. A packed crab, yeah. This is millions of eggs in here. And that's illegal to keep? Get, that's illegal to keep in Louisiana. Yeah, well, we don't want to keep them anyway. We no. want to go back in that's and right. drop those eggs. Well, how long will she stay like this? That crab right there, looking at it, I'd probably say two weeks. And then she'll just drop and them off. And then she'll just, she'll just drop them off. Anthony and I are fourth generation. So I, I've got about 40 years in, and my brother's 35 over that. I don't think we could do anything else if we wanted to. All summer, from the time I was born, we would go out, you know, school would end, and we'd, we'd be out there the whole entire summer, you know, and, and they would fish oysters, you know, and fix the boats and get ready for the next season. So I grew up with that. And it was not easy to just walk away from. Sam and Anthony Slavich are deep-rooted in the oyster biz. In 1902, their great-grandfather began work in the U.S. as an oysterman at 12 years old after his parents had died. After several trips back home to Yugoslavia, he decided to bring his wife and kids back to the States to make a life for themselves. Uh, my brother and I uh, try to assess the, the stocks that we have available to us in this lease. It's uh, one of our prime producing leases. We're hoping to determine you know, where we can begin working, you know, what type of product we'll have available to us at that time. Oyster fishing is really just the end result of what truly is oyster farming. Mother Nature can only produce so many oysters per season, so actually creating and aiding other producing reefs is the key to productivity. 
The process of bedding or farming begins with small gravel-sized pieces of crushed concrete, creating a rough surface so that the small baby oysters, or spat as they are called, can attach to it and hold themselves in place so as not to be carried away by tide and also for protection from predators. You get a school of black drum and these oyster beds, and this is one bite. They'll swallow that, that, that whole rock, and there's a plate in their throat that, that crushes the, 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 the oyster shell, and they, they swallow the meat, and they spit the shells out through their gills and through their mouth and, and get rid of the shell and swallow the meat. They, it's like a, an oyster-eating machine. The state actually helps these oystermen by seeding oysters on state-owned waters. Then by season, the oyster fishers are able to dredge those reefs, picking up the smaller spat and then replanting them to their own leases. The state holds probably half of the uh, productive, productive oyster grounds as seed grounds and uh, that's what fishermen typically go to get their feed oysters. And if not available there, they, uh, they have to take you know, a different route and uh, uh, either transplant from their own leases or plant some uh, uh, culch material so, so that their, their next spat catch would be a, a better one. So as you can see, a ton goes into oyster fishing before the first oyster ever hits the boat. I would say a good day is, is uh, any time you can, you can break 100 sacks of oysters in a day. Uh, that, that would be a, a really nice day. God, no, it's got to be over 100 pounds. It's about 100 pounds. It's, it's in that range. Right, about a, right, right around 100. Size really does matter when it comes to oysters. A 3 to 4 inch oyster is considered just about perfect for half shell. The average growth of an oyster is about one inch per year, so from spat to harvest, well, you could do the math. It looks like it's got three growing years in it. You, know, you got one, two, three. I'm, I'm going to go with three years on that oyster. You can see the lines of growth. And right. It's up here, here. So that, yeah, they're, they're going to shoot out from November through January, January well, to February, they'll, they'll grow. And you'll see this flake on the edge. You see this oyster is growing already. Here's August and they're growing. You see that flake? That's right, new growth right. on the oyster. A few other facts about harvesting. Any oyster that is meant for raw consumption must be refrigerated within one hour of leaving the water. Anything over that time limit must be shucked and processed. This is what they do. It's what they love. It's what defines them. And it's the reason they endure day after day, no matter what is thrown at them. Work hard and live the best you can. Past generations taught it to them. America should look at their example. Well, joining us now to talk more about harvesting seafood is Martin Bourgeois, a marine biologist with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. James Bajeron, a commercial fisherman from the city of Lafitte, just south of New Orleans. And Rick Phillips from Phillips Seafood in Bayou Pigeon. Welcome, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you here. We've got thousands of students who are participating in this uh, electronic classroom. So we're going to have a great discussion about the Louisiana seafood industry. First off, I know you all love it. Tell us why you love it so much. James, let's start with you. Probably the most important thing for me is uh, everybody who has a regular job to me goes into an office and everything else. There's nothing better than about 5, 30, 15 to 6 whenever you're riding through that marsh and that sun comes up mm. and said, this is my office. Mm, beautiful. And you work for yourself and I mean, pretty much the advance can, can be on your own. I mean, as hard as you want to work, the more money you can make doing it, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's all dependent on you. You have nobody to depend on but yourself. Yeah. Rick, what about you? Oh, it's like Mother Nature's your boss, you know. <laughs> and every morning when you leave out, you know, it's, it's such beautiful country down here in South Louisiana. It just gives you that feeling. It's hard to explain. It's yeah. a freedom. It's about America. It's about being, you know, your own boss and going out there in that beautiful swamp every day. It's just hard to explain. You got to do it. Yeah, yeah. And Martin, what about you? Well, my interest kind of goes way back as a, as a kid <laughs> in, in the love of hunting and fishing and in yep. our great outdoors. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's evolved to a career and working with guys like Rick and, and James is 
very rewarding. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, it started for you as a child, and because we have lots of students who are uh, watching in, and they may have interest in, you know, fishing and in hunting and in just being out there um, in Mother Nature. This is such a huge industry, and we have students from all across the state, north, south, and central mm -hmm. Louisiana, and there's room for all of them in this business. So talk a little bit about how to get started. You know what I love what Ewell said is that you're not bound by the coast, and I think what's really great is that that today we're going to show students that it's not just about fishing. I mean, that's one great part of it, but there's so many other aspects to being involved in this industry. Well, pretty much, you know, it's it's from most fishermen that where we come from, you know, it was all from their dad turned them into this and everything else like that. But I was my my dad wasn't a fisherman, you know, and now I am a fisherman. Mm. But Yes, whenever you get started on a shrimp boat, you work as a deckhand on a crab boat, get started as a deckhand and save your money up where you can, you know, get your own stuff started, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people don't have them resources, but all you got to do is have, have, have the drive. Yeah, yeah. Have and, the drive. And you talk about processing. That's another part of it. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Because I know well, you've been involved in that area. Processing, I kind of got into it midstream, you know, uh, started off uh, born and raised in Baton Rouge. My dad sort of bring me down to buy a pigeon at a young age. And mm -hmm crawfishing, frogging, catfishing, all that. I had my own boat and was crawfishing at eight years old. You know, he'd bring me out there, put me in a boat, and I'd paddle and run 20 traps. And that evolved into commercial fishing on the side after school. And then when I got out of school, I tried college and ended up commercial fishing. Did that all the way 20 years. Then we were having trouble selling it. So we started buying, you know, marketing. And, and then we had to process because sometimes, you know, Monday and Tuesday, you can't sell crawfish. You got to peel them. So right, right. It just evolved into all of that, you know, and uh, you got to stay ambidextrous and do different things. Yeah, you got to keep your mind open and to different right. uh, different opportunities that will come your way. Well, right. let's take some of the questions from some of the schools out there. Our first question comes to us from Carla Duplachain's class from Gonzales Middle School, and the question is, what sort of seafood can you catch in Louisiana waters? What's out there? Martin? Well, Carla, mm -hmm. that's just about everything that goes into a seafood gumbo. <laughs> <laughs> Shauna. I'm sorry. That's okay. Shauna. <laughs> it's oysters shrimp, crab, and then the whole gamut of, of crawfish, of course, and then the whole gamut of, of, of the finfish species, which might be tuna off the coast of Louisiana, yep. yeah. uh, wahoo, dolphin, now dolphin fish, mahi-mahi, not, not uh, dolphin uh, the mammal, but uh, also sheep's head, flounder, drum, it's a, it's a whole laundry list. Wow. But Louisiana is probably best known for its crabs, and shrimp and oysters. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We actually lead the nation in those yep. three categories. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think it's so important for the kids who are watching today to understand that anytime they go out and order seafood at a restaurant, it, wherever they are, whether they're anywhere throughout this state, they could be on vacation someplace else, visiting right. re relatives or visiting a new place for the first time. If they order seafood, chances are pretty good that that seafood came from Louisiana, right? That's it. Right. Right. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, Martin, you're on the science side of it. So, tell us how you got involved with that aspect of it, and, and what does that really involve? Well, <clears throat> obviously, as a, as a fisheries biologist, it does require uh, a college education. I uh, graduated in a, with a degree in marine biology and went to work for the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. But the role of, of the department is, is from the management perspective. You know, these fisheries are available to harvest, but the management part of it is important because our role is to ensure that these resources, these fisheries, are uh, executed on a sustainable basis mm -hmm. from year to year, that people can continue to, to earn a living right. and operate a business as long as these resources remain uh, at sustainable levels. Right, and we have an abundant amount of resources. We're really blessed to have all of the natural resources that we do have. Let's talk a little bit about the six categories of uh, commercial seafood in Louisiana, if you could run through those. Rick, could you give us, uh, tell us what those are? Well, locally where we're at, we have crawfish, of course, catfish, and we have a lot of other things that's not real popular but good to eat. You know, even these jumping fish, these Asian carp, uh, the meat's really good on that. Jumping fish? I've never heard of jumping <laughs> fish. Yeah, we call them <laughs> Asian carp. But, uh, okay. Uh, they, uh, there's a lot of things in the swamp that you'd be surprised. You know, the frogs, and uh, uh, they got people eat German carp. 
uh, buffalo fish. They really good smoke, you know, and uh, we use a lot of this for bait, you know. But there's a lot of different things that you can go after and make money with. You just right. gotta have the one. And there the students see on our screen. We've got thin fish, crab, mm -hmm. shrimp, crawfish, oysters, and alligator. Alligator mm -hmm. really has become incredibly popular uh, over popular. these last uh, several years, right, James? Very popular. And they got a lot of fishermen from where we at. Mm -hmm. And pretty much I think the season's gonna be this coming month right here. And they give out certain tags to certain fishermen and stuff, so. Can you all talk a little bit about, I'm glad that you mentioned that, the seasons, because it's important. You've got a certain season for shrimps, right, for shrimping, and yes. you've got a certain season for alligator hunting, and, and talk a little bit about that. Uh, the only one that we don't have a really a season on is, I uh, believe, is uh, pretty much crabbing. We can we can crab all year round. Okay. You know? Yeah. But there's only going to be, it, there are certain areas that you have to pick up your traps certain times of the year, so like that we can have their trap cleanups and stuff like that. Okay, so. all right. Let's go back to the classrooms out there. We have our second question. Now this is from Mr. Bradfield's class from Raceland Middle School. The question is, what type of careers are available in the seafood industry in Louisiana? I think what we've heard so far from uh, Yule and from the other package that we um, aired, there are a lot of opportunities in this industry. Well, you could be, you could be a deck hand. you could be the fisherman yourself. You know, you can work for the processor, you mm -hmm. can be a dealer, you know, you can even sell off the side of the road as a wholesale retail, mm -hmm. you know, be, where you just purchase from the factories and then you can go out and sell, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, there's, there's many, many opportunities. Yeah. And I think it's also important to add that there are a number of businesses that support commercial fishing. Right. These are the net shops. These are the mm -hmm. marine yes. hardware stores. These are the businesses that might build crab traps. So yeah. there's, is a, a, a a, a big web, so to speak, of, of, of mm -hmm. businesses that support the seafood industry. Right, and you yeah. can even develop your own television show, right, Rick? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that helps promote it. Anything know. is possible in this industry, <laughs> Anything right? Anything is possible, you know. That was another way of promoting what we have, to yeah. me, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, getting yeah. it out there. Yeah, you know? and I think, you know, it's so important. Uh, some of the students may be familiar with Bayou Pigeon. Some mm -hmm. of the students may not be so familiar with Bayou Pigeon. You didn't grow up in Bayou Pigeon. No. Where is Bayou Pigeon? It's about... Oh, from Plaquemine, about 30 minutes southwest. You southwest? know, it's uh, right above Pier Park, okay. Bell River area, it's right below Bayou Sorrel. Okay, you know. okay. Uh, it's a little small town. Okay. And it's so lots when, of them. When we, lo there are lots of them, and they're all over this state. We typically think South Louisiana, I think, in terms of where you might be able to make a great living in the seafood industry, but just as you pointed out, there are so many different aspects to this industry that you could be living in Caddo, you could be living in Central Louisiana, you could be living anywhere across the state for any of the students out there who have an interest in this industry, no matter where you are, and find something that might uh, be of interest to you. Right. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So what is a typical day like for a marine biologist? Well, it it starts early when the rooster crows. And, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He's it's, thinking it's, of my job. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's very uh, you I'm know, sensing it, a common theme here. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing is ever typical. Uh, there's always uh, a variation, but it involves a lot of field work. Uh -huh. uh, field work meaning there's a lot of biological sampling that takes place mm -hmm. using a variety of different gears. Mm -hmm. And that's how we use, for instance, trawls to monitor shrimp populations and their distribution and abundance mm -hmm. and growth. We might use gill nets to monitor finfish populations, trammel nets, seines to, to also to, to monitor finfish mm -hmm. populations, crab traps obviously to look at, at crab catch, but mm -hmm. we also look at trawls to look at juvenile crab abundance. And then there's uh, on the oyster beds, on the oyster grounds, we use um, oyster dredges, but we also do diving on these reefs to, mm -hmm. to look at, uh, at the density and to come up with a stock size, for instance, on certain reefs. Mm, well, it sounds and, interesting. And, and of course, there's the, you know, that's the fun part. Yeah, you know, oh, the, that's the fun part? It sounds know, fun. It's, it's, of course, you know, there's <laughs> gear to maintain. You know, everything breaks from time to time. Sure. So we fix what we can. And, mm -hmm. And then there's data entry. All the system information has to go into a, a data entry system where it can be accessed for analysis. Yeah, well, it sounds very, very interesting. And I just thank you all for being here and talking to us for this uh, time that we've uh, shared. Thank but you. we're going to turn our attention right now to the processing side of mm -hmm. the business. You talked a little bit about that earlier, Rick. Mm -hmm. We're going to go again to reporter John Jackson, who is on a mission. This time he travels to New Orleans to the P&J Oyster Company that's been growing and selling oysters nationwide for over 125 years. 
Well, our day usually starts about three in the morning. You know, we get down here and start unloading the trucks. And as the shuckers start coming in, we start processing, which uh, usually begins about five in the morning. To say that P&J Oyster has been in the oyster business for a long time is an understatement. You know, oysters are not easy to do. Shucking oysters is a hard job. John Popich, a Croatian fisherman, migrated to New Orleans and started the business. Our family, the Sinceris, got involved in the oyster business in 1921 uh, when my grandfather uh, uh, tried to marry my grandmother. He, he, her father told him that uh, he needed to make more money if he wanted to marry my grandmother and keep her in the lifestyle she was accustomed. Founded in 1876, P&J has over 130 years in the business, the oldest in the United States. You know, I feel like uh, oyster water runs through our bloodstream. Through the good times and bad, Al, Brother Sal, and the entire Sinceri family have kept P&J a household name when it comes to premium oysters. This is our life, this is our culture, uh, this is our what we do. It is a sincerity. How many sacks a day do you guys put up here and, and hand shuck on Not, a normal day? We used to shuck between 120 and 140 a day. And as you'll see, this is a very high quality oyster, uh, quite different than what you would typically see this time of the year. It's very important to us that we uh, provide our customers with the best oysters available. The season on oysters goes from when to when. But oysters are good to eat 12 months out of the year. Absolutely, it's a myth, right? It, Only the R months, it's a myth. It's correct? absolutely a myth. You know, the best oysters you're gonna find will run between November and July. Right. And, uh, you know, those first couple of R months, uh, September and October, aren't as good as you know, May uh, uh, and June and, right. and July. Now explain why they're so good in May, June, and July. Well, the oysters are still full, and at the same time, they're salty. The chefs that, I, that we deal with would rather see an oyster that's salty, full, and, and firm. Now, oysters come in by the sack, and some are tagged for half shell or raw consumption. The rest, well, they're hand shucked and then they go through several processes before shipped out for cooking. How do you get started breaking rocks open for a living? Well, I started working on the oyster boat. That's how I got introduced to the oyster, working on the oyster boat. Like out there, we used to shuck our own oysters to make certain meals there, so I learned to shuck oysters on the oyster boat. On a good day, how many sacks you go through? Well, in my youth, I went through 23 sacks. That was that's the most I ever done within a day. But that was back when I was a youngster and I was really excited about being fast. These days, I'm more, I'm more interested in being a good quality oyster sucker than being fast. But when I was like 20, 22, 23, I wanted to be the fastest sucker around. A good shucker like Mr. Willie can go through a whole sack in 35 to 40 minutes. That's 100 pounds of oysters, and this is how he does it. Man, I don't know what ends what. What, what are we looking for? Well, this is the rear end right here. Mm -hmm. This is where the hinge at. That's what most oysters shuck, especially uh, one that shuck on the head shell like he's doing. Right, right. They go through here, they press knife it right here. But some, they're working oyster houses, they hit it back there to jar it loose. Just to get it loose, mm -hmm. then they go through here and cut the eye out, which the eye is up front though, you know. From the shucker's table, the oysters are then cleaned several times. Right now what we're doing, they, they just shucked the sack of oysters and we're going to do the first process uh, in which we rinse the oysters off to try to make sure there isn't any grit in these oysters. There's so much salt in these oysters, it'll take a lot more than this to get it out. Right. And the main thing is to make sure there isn't any little pieces of shell left over on the oysters. These will be for fried oysters, baked oyster dishes, lots of different things that you'll find at, at the restaurants. Do you charge by the pound? How, how, does, no, it, how does it go? We, do it. we want to make sure that they are filled. That's the key. We're selling by volume. A gallon is a gallon is a gallon. When people tell you five pounds, that's not a gallon. This is a gallon of oysters. It's a gallon. I don't think you can put another one in there. And, and you can't. And now this 
the next step is we're going to take this and we're going to go into another vat that is ice cold water. This is a, a blowing tank and a chilling tank and uh, we'll go ahead and turn this machine on in a moment and show how uh, these oysters are processed through the next step. We'll put 20 gallons of oysters in there. We'll blow it for uh, 10 minutes at the most. To make sure that the oysters are as clean as possible when they leave your place. That's right. We want to make sure that they've uh, as little shell as possible. Mostly everything will go to the bottom. These oysters now come out of their second 40 degree jacuzzi into a draining tray. The cleaning process is for an exact amount of time to preserve quality. This doesn't do anything to take the flavor out well, of the oyster. Well, if you do it the right way, it won't. It won't. You, you know, we follow the same way they've done it for 100 years, right. and that is to do it this way. And you will maintain that good flavor. Do y'all find a lot of pearls? Well, we do find pearls, and it all happens to be certain times of the year from certain growing areas. And you might find as many as uh, five pearls in an oyster. But they're not anything you can make. No secondary out. market here? No secondary market pearls. <laughs> I was going to come, and if you just happen to throw them out on the street, I'll be there. <laughs> the care to preserve the quality of these oysters even reaches into the trucks that deliver them. Why are these trucks so cold? John, we come here uh, first thing in the morning, turn these trucks on and get them pre-chilled so that when we take the oysters out of the stationary cooler, we want to make sure they're going on a truck that's 33 right. degrees. This is the care you guys take, maybe above and beyond, to keep your product perfect. We don't want to keep them out of refrigeration very long, so it's very important. Refrigeration is key to having a high quality product. From here, where do we go? We're going to be going off to uh, one of the restaurants and delivering the French Quarter in just a little bit. When you get P&J oysters, you're getting them straight for the Gulf, and you're getting them at local restaurants around New Orleans. That's the only place you're going to get them is if you get them in New Orleans. Got to come to New Orleans. You got to come to South Louisiana to get the best oysters in the world anyway. That's it. And make sure they got that P&J stamp. You stamp every one of them? Uh, you can ask the uh, people where they get them from, and you'll know if they got P&J oysters just by looking at the quality of the oyster. Well, we can certainly see why they've been in business so long. Joining me again on the set are Martin Bourgeois. He's a marine biologist with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Rick Phillips from Phillips Seafood and Bayou Pigeon. And James Bajeron, a commercial fisherman from the city of Lafitte, just south of New Orleans. And gentlemen, we're going to continue our discussion. We just learned about processing there. And James, you process your seafood, the crab. So talk a little bit about that. We just learned a lot about oysters. Yeah, we pretty much uh, we process our soft crabs, which is called a buster. Uh, that's whenever you can take a crab that's about two and a half three inches long most of them and whenever they come out they're like almost five six inches long and they're soft oh and okay they're sold as a soft shell crab okay also known as busters well the buster is before the, the soft buster shell. oh before yeah. the okay okay yes, okay indeed okay. so pretty much i mean that's our market all my hard <laughs> crabs go to the dealers in town right there so Okay, all right, and so processing, I mean, is that something that you initially thought you would get involved with, or did that no, just sort of evolve? No, pretty much, it kind of, it, it came around. Whenever you're a hard crab fisherman and you're catching all these busters and everything, I mean, pretty much, instead of you selling about a pound, then all of a sudden you're selling about a crab. So instead of you getting this for amount of, for poundage of crabs, you're getting one price for one crab. So pretty much you're making quite a bit more money off of one crab compared to selling about a pound. Right. And we have a big uh, amount of crab that we sell all over the uh, United States. We're number two in the country, yes, right? Yes, we're number two. Num that's huge. Yes, very That huge. is really huge. I've got to ask you all something too, because this is something that the students are really interested in. We've weathered so many storms here, man-made and natural. Um, and this is a business that still continues to grow. It still continues to flourish. Um, people are still getting involved in it. What do you say to students out there about that, Martin? I, I think it's important that it, it says a lot about the character of, of, of fishermen and, and fishing businesses that uh, regardless of how devastated they might become due to storms or other natural disasters, that their passion is there. And, and it, which makes them very successful. You know, people yeah. make a very good living 
doing this, but it's hard work mm -hmm. and it takes sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Rick, can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? You know, that it is hard work, but it is good work and um, it's work that you can, can be very proud of. Yes, it's very hard work. A lot of people are shocked when they see it, yeah. you know, but it's also very rewarding work, you know, and, uh, and all the storms we've had and everything, it's just uh, these fishermen are, are so resilient and tough. It's mm -hmm. just uh, I'm proud to deal with them and be part of their, their world, you yeah. know. Uh, basically, uh, after Katrina, uh, we thought it was the end of the world, you know. You never would have thought we'd be where we're at right now, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. after all that. You yeah, know? and we're in a really good place, would you say? That mm -hmm. we're in a really good place when it yeah. comes to the seafood industry. Sure. It's, it just keeps growing, you know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Basically, where I'm at, I, I, my world revolves around the fishermen. Whatever they do, I mean, we, when crawfish season's in play, we process crawfish. And when that's over, they go catfishing. We're processing catfish right now. Now, alligator season starts next week, we'll be processing alligator. And then when that's over, <laughs> back to catfish. Sometimes both at the same time. <laughs> then we start buying bait and in the winter, you know, and yeah. buffalo and carp, and we cut it up for crawfish bait. And it's just mm -hmm. a revolving circle. It just circle. keeps going. Mm -hmm. It keeps mm -hmm. going. James, can you talk a little bit about what the outlook is and some of the technology that's involved? Because I think the students would be really interested in knowing that technology is also a part of this industry. Uh, it's a big part of it, really. I mean, pretty much in the winter time, we, we go out and fish the lake and everything. And I mean, you got to run your radars and your, your GPSs and stuff like that, and you need to know how to read them. You know, there's nothing that you just can't go out there on a whim and say, well, that's where my traps were. You know, I mean, pretty much whenever there's a fog and you can't see your hand in front of you, and we're still running out traps out there. We're running on radar and we're running by GPS, you know? Mm -hmm. And yes, you need some schooling for it. You mm -hmm. really do. Mm -hmm. Plus, I mean, once you, once you get back, then you gotta, you gotta save your money for whenever you lose traps, you know? Mm. Whenever, you're gonna lose 100 to 200 a year. It depends how many you fish. And you're just gonna lose them because they're just well, going to? Well, recreational boulders run over them. Okay. Pretty much whenever the tide comes in hard in the winter time, then they're gonna roll out storms. with the tide, storms, mm -hmm. everything okay. else. So okay. you do have to save your money for them rainy days. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's very well rewarding whenever you don't get them storms because that's money that you're ahead of the game. Yeah, okay, and I think we just had another question up there from um, another class, and we're gonna pop that question back out, up, up there because that uh, question comes from James Monahan's class. Uh, from Chalmette High School, and the question is, what is the job outlook for the next 10 to 20 years? What would you say, Martin? I would say that um, the outlook is, is promising. Um, with fisheries, there's always change, and, and nothing actually stands still in life. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to, for the students to understand that there are opportunities here in, in the seafood fishing business and, and in the seafood processing business. Um, in Louisiana, we have what's known as an open access fishery. There are no, let's say, limits on the number of licenses that we issue, for instance, to crab or to shrimp or to oyster. Okay. Uh, everyone is essentially qualified to purchase a license and become a, f a commercial fisherman. And so, so let me stop you right there before you go on, because you mentioned licenses. Talk a little bit about how important it is to have a license and what it goes into getting that license. Well, it is important to have a license. And there are many different types of licenses yeah. that we see there. Right. And, and you know, licensing, of course, is, is, is mandatory. It's the law says you shall have right. a commercial fisherman's license. So anyone who has any intent of harvesting fish, shrimp, or whatever, for sale has to have a commercial fisherman's license. In addition to that, they have to have a special license for their vessel. It's called a vessel That's license. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's the different gear types of licenses. For instance, there's a special license for a shrimp trawl, a special traps. license for a crab Rats. trap, mm -hmm. an oyster dredge, and, and right on down the line. Now on the buying side, for instance, Rick may have a wholesale retail dealer's license. Okay. That license allows him to buy directly from commercial fishermen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now in addition to uh, to Rick, we collect landing statistics on what's harvested through what's called a trip ticket reporting system. It's right. mandatory that at the first point of sale, information on that transaction 
what the species was. So they'll know the landings, how the, the wild fisheries know what's going on. Is, is captured on this form and, and, and where submitted it was to the department. Okay, so what is that form called again? A trip, trip ticket, ticket form. A trip ticket yeah. form. Mm -hmm. So that lets you know what you caught, mm -hmm. how much you caught, mm -hmm. where you caught. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Very right. important <laughs> okay. information. Right. Yeah. Okay, so very important piece of information. <laughs> That's right, a very important piece of information that you have to fill out. And every time we go to the docking cell, you get one of them. That's okay, it. every For time. your records and one of them goes to wildlife right. and fisheries. Okay, all and right. And even if a, if a commercial fisherman decides to retail his catch directly to a consumer, that provision still stands. He has to do That's right. or his complete own. the trip. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you all specialize in wild caught, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean exactly? <laughs> That's living off the land, really. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is not something yeah. that's, that, that you put in a pond and you say we're going to, this is something that you go out there and you fight the elements all year long mm -hmm. to go catch these, right. you know, your crabs and your shrimp and everything's coming from the Gulf on mm -hmm. our side, yeah. you know. Well, I'm at the Chaffalai Basin and all the land surrounding it, swamp and basically private and state-owned land. Okay. Go, mm -hmm. Basically going yeah. out there, mm -hmm. like the gold rush, you just head out there and go after go it. Go after know? it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, and I, I think the, for the students, it's the greatest distinction is just, these are fishes, whatever, that are harvested in the wild versus fish or crawfish or whatever that might be cultured in a pond, kind of in a farm type of setting. That's the big distinction between wild caught and, and cultured. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And, and you talked a little bit about licenses. Um, what about the regulatory agencies? Because you there there are agencies that regulate what is caught out there mm -hmm. and brought in at the federal level and at the state level that I know you all know very, very well. well James, why don't we start with you? Pretty much I'd rather Martin answer that because mm -hmm. he knows more about Martin? Okay, yeah. Martin. Well, at the federal level, the National Marine Fishery Service is the federal agency that regulates commercial and recreational fishing activities on the national level. Okay. Uh, here on the state level, there's the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, mm -hmm. and we regulate the resource itself. There's also the Department of Health and Hospitals, and they have an important role because they ensure and monitor seafood safety in terms from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, the Department of Natural Resources, the Office of Coastal Restoration and Protection, which are important because these are the agencies that watch over habitats. Mm -hmm. and habitats are really important because they support our fisheries. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's very important that we protect and restore our habitats. And maintain those habitats. Okay, let's go and take another question from a student this time. We're going to go to Chris Howell's class from Shreveport. Love Shreveport. I'm from Shreveport. Mm -hmm. The question is, how can an interested high school student get more information about a career in the seafood industry? Where can these high school students go who are, who are interested in pursuing uh, a career in the seafood industry? Of course, we've learned so much about how many different career opportunities there are. So who wants to take that question? Pretty much, if if, he, if they got the heart and they want to learn, I mean, pretty much you can just come down to South Louisiana, you can just, where the vessels are, talk talk to the fishermen, mm -hmm. go to the processors, go to the dealers and stuff, and I mean, if you show interest, they will put you on. Yeah, I, I can tell you for a fact, because I have uh, been fortunate enough to do some stories with fishermen. I've been mm -hmm. out there on the boats, and uh, it's beautiful. I, I can't, you, you're right, you can't really describe how beautiful it mm -hmm. is until you experience That's right. it. That's right. But I have to say, the passion and the love that they have every time, no matter who I've interviewed, mm -hmm. it's there. And the thing that students should know is that the fishermen are willing to talk, to share, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. yeah, because they want kids to get involved and, and interested in it, That's right? right. Yeah, okay. It depends on what you're interested in. Is it as a young person, you know, you know, you go after it and go look for it. Go offer your services to a fisherman, trying to introduce yourself. Uh, look, I'll go help you. You know, and that's how you learn. I don't think you can Google it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's talk a little bit about what happens um, about the the marketing and distribution side of it, because that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, who wants to take that one? I mean, that that's getting it out there. That's letting people know about it, that's especially those kids who yeah. may be in North Louisiana who are very interested yeah. in that aspect well, of it. There's a lot of pride in our seafood. You know, this has been going on for 400 years. You know, it's a tradition. It's a, it's a, you you sell that point first. My my philosophy is win the hearts and minds first, and they'll buy your seafood. You know, there's so <laughs> many imports out there, and uh, mm. you know it's it's just uh, the where it comes from is such beautiful country and all. You know, it's uh, uh, that's a lot of the sales. 
pitch, I do, you okay. know, and, and uh, the, the seafood, we're regulated really well. Uh, we, the health department, when I process, you just wouldn't believe the regulations, which is all good because we got the perfect product, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, even alligators, uh, we got to use a metal detector on all the meat just in case when they were shot a piece of lead might be in there you know mm -hmm. we take every precaution and a time to make sure limit it's safe right very yeah. safe right you know, yeah our local seafood yeah you know. martin and and i i think it's important too that that you know there's seafood and then there's louisiana seafood mm -hmm. and it's important i think that we get our stamp our that that consumers know that hey when we're looking for seafood we want louisiana seafood because right. it's the best so right we need to continue those efforts to get our product out front and, and have it labeled as something unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, James? Yeah, because once they taste our seafood, they're not going <laughs> That's back. it. That's There's it. nothing better. I not think we, we have that consensus, right? Yes, There's indeed. nothing better. Yes, indeed. There's like no fresh. seafood better than Louisiana seafood. Okay. Wow. We are completely out of time. Thank you all so mm -hmm. much. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you. I've learned so much and I really, really appreciate your time. Well, we have had such an exciting hour. We hope that you have learned about how important the seafood industry is to Louisiana's culture and its economy. While most people think it's a coastal business and doesn't affect North Louisiana, we certainly have learned that it not only impacts people and businesses all over this state, but the nation as well. And with the proper education, business skills, and hard work, you too can enjoy a fulfilling life working in this growing industry. Please join us for the next session when we'll look at selling the seafood to business and to consumers. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, the Louisiana Seafood Promotions and Marketing Board, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, thanks so much for watching. Great job! Bye.